Welcome to Science Unwrapped. We've got, I, I know it's going to be a really interesting talk that you'll enjoy tonight. I'll give you the title in just a moment because it's a tongue twister. Uh, and I'll introduce our speaker, Dr. Keith Roper, in just a moment. But what I want to do before we get uh, going on tonight's talk is to tell you what this year's theme is about. It's Science on the Horizon. And the idea of the talks in this series is to feature the positive nature of science. Last year, by coincidence, we featured some of the dark sides of science right in the middle of a pandemic. And that was a bad idea, right? This year, still in a pandemic, we're looking at the, the positives, the, the good that science can bring. As you'll see from Dr. Roper's talk, there's a lot of good that science can bring to, to us as individuals and society as a whole. Before we get going, though, I want to thank a number of people. I want to thank the Science Unwrapped Committee, who helps make these talks possible. I want to thank our volunteers, who in a more standard year would be out in the halls and manning tables, and we'll be back to those days again, I hope soon. But for now, I want to thank our volunteers for having lots of videos that feature hands-on science activities. And there are a lot of them. They're really kind of cool. We have two new ones that have just been posted, one by the Society of Women Engineers, How to Make a Mechanical Hand. And that's a fun one. And the other is Engineers Without Borders sponsored. And this is a great one for Engineers Without Borders. And that is How to Make Your Own Water Filter. So check those out on our Science Unwrapped website. For our audience at home, uh, please submit your questions as you have them. And that's done through a question feature in the AggieCast up in the upper right portion of your screen. The only trick in submitting questions is don't log out of the chat until you've seen the message, the moderator has joined the chat. Because if you log out before then, your question is lost, and we don't want to lose your questions. Right? So, so please do that if you're watching at home. OK, let me introduce uh, Keith Roper, who I've just had the privilege of meeting last week. Uh, Keith is a Utah native. In fact, uh, was born in Logan. And Keith and I were speaking. He spent uh, most of his childhood down in Utah County. And after that, everything gets fuzzy for me until a, a terrible mistake. And that is the first part of Keith's CV where it reads that he has a bachelor's degree from BYU. <laughs> and a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering, which, which is not a mistake. And actually, as you know, I'm giving you a hard time. A BYU, as, as a USU Aggie, has to do. Uh, Keith went on to get his PhD also in chemical engineering from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. And from there, Keith went on to a whole bunch of different places, starting at the Merck Research Institute, and then into academia, where, if I remember right, and I'm going to take a quick look over here, you spent some time, actually quite a few years, at the U of U. Mm -hmm. You spent time at the University of Arkansas, where you were the Charles W. Oxford Professor of Emerging Technologies there. Uh, and then. Keith and I were speaking, he was an NSF program director for four years, two different stints as I understand it, one for engineering research, another for engineering teaching, which is, which is really cool. And then we were lucky at USU in 2019 to have uh, Keith come to our institution where he became and still is department head of uh, the Department of Biological Engineering. Uh, Keith's list of accolades is long. And in fact, I, I've got a really shortened list over here because it's, it would take uh, as much time as the talk for me to read all the different honors and awards, publications, and so on that, that uh, Keith has on his CV. But Keith is past president of uh, the Institute for Biological Engineering. Uh, an associate editor of the IEEE Transactions on Nanotechnology. And for those of you who don't know IEEE, that's a big thing in electrical engineering. Okay. Uh, a fellow of the American Institute for Medical and Biological Engineering. Okay. All kinds of patents, publications, two textbooks, if I remember. So, you know, 
Keith is, is a bona fide scientist and uh, will have to give credit for engineer as well for the College of Engineering. Um, the title of Dr. Roper's talk is An Inconvenient Truth uh, and Lifting Viral Fingerprints from Water and Air. So, so Keith, I'm going to let you take it away, but I'm going to tell the audience, Keith is a ton of really cool props that I think would be really <laughs> fun tonight. So, so Keith. Thanks, Greg. Thank you for being here tonight. Thanks also to Greg and to Marianne and Science Unwrapped for inviting me to come and give this presentation. They asked me to design it so that it could be understood across all age groups. And so the first thing I did was I said, someone might not know what a sleuth is, so let's turn that into detective. Mm -hmm. Just kind of simplify things here a little bit. And I, I hope that there's useful information here across all those age groups and that you find value as well as maybe some entertainment out of the lecture tonight. My name's Keith Roper. As Greg said, I'm a professor and department head of biological engineering here at Utah State University. And I never imagined when I came here in January of 2019 what might lay ahead over the next couple years. So this is kind of an arc of, of, of a lot of my experience since then. I want to start out by saying I love autumn in Logan. What could be better than Halloween on Center Street? Going to the witches dance, marching down Center Street with those historic homes in your costumes, walking up to a door, <coughs> ringing the bell, the door opens and trick or treat. The only thing I might like better than autumn in Logan is summertime. Summer is my favorite season, and one of my favorite places to go is down in southeastern Utah. One of my favorite places in southeastern Utah is Goblin Valley. So this is the three sisters in Goblin Valley you might recognize. And if you look above the three sisters, you'll see one of the most phenomenal nighttime star exhibits that you might find there, which is the Milky Way. I'm curious if anyone here offhand knows how many stars there are in the Milky Way. Plus or minus, plus or minus a few hundred million. Well, let's, let's maybe take a poll. How many say there's more than a hundred million? Okay, got some, got some takers there. How many say there's more than a billion? Okay, still on board. More than 10 billion. Now we're getting just a little cautious. Up to a hundred billion? Anybody, any takers for a hundred billion? How many for more than 100 billion? Well, I could just keep going, couldn't I? I'll, I'll stop at 100 billion. There are 100 billion, according to astronomers, stars in the Milky Way. And when you go down to Goblin Valley, you can see, maybe not all of them, but you can see a lot of them because of the lack of light pollution. Well, what else is there in Goblin Valley? There might be 100 billion cockleburs. When I put cockleburs on my draft presentation and I gave it to the adjudicators, they said, what's a cockleburr? In Texas, we call those sticker burrs. So I had to add sticker burr to make sure that everybody understood. And you know what these things are. There's those little tiny balls that stick to your socks or stick to your pants. And you can find them pretty much everywhere in southeastern Utah as well as the Milky Way. Well, if I'm feeling adventurous during the summer, one of the places I love to go is Lagoon. And one of my favorite rides since I was this young in Utah Valley has been the log flume. Climb up the stairs, get on that log boat, whoosh down the flume, splash down in that lake. One of my favorite things to do. Well, these and a lot of other things over the past couple years were canceled because of COVID-19 and the pandemic. And just out of curiosity, how many of you found the COVID-19 pandemic to be at least an inconvenience, if maybe not more than that? I know that some of my colleagues sitting here in the room had to cancel family vacations to Paris, France because of the, because of the pandemic, and that's a real tragedy. That's much more than inconvenience. Well, I'm gonna talk a little bit about today about an unexpected adventure that I had and some of us here had during the pandemic, some of us shared that experience. We'll talk about COVID-19. First of all, what is COVID-19? 
you can think about COVID-19 a little bit like a sticker burr. It's a shell like a plastic egg that you might get for Easter, and surrounding that shell are a bunch of stickers. Scientists call those a spike protein, but you can think about them as stickers. Inside the shell, there is what I'd like you to think about for a minute tonight, at least a zipper. And so when you leave today, you'll have the opportunity to pick up a bag with these things in them and you can make your own COVID-19 if you haven't already and uh, get an idea of what COVID-19 is like. Well, let's explore COVID-19 a little bit. How big or really how small is COVID-19? So here I have kind of a ruler and it's an interesting ruler because it starts at a millimeter, which is one one thousand for the meter, and it goes down by decades to a micron, one one millionth of a meter, all the way down to nanometers, which is one one billionth of a meter. And just, to, just for perspective, I show you about the size of a human hair. That's about the limit of what we can see. It's about 120 microns or micrometers here between 100 micrometers and a millimeter. So on this scale, you can also see several other different types of atoms and molecules and entities, including virus. Who would like to hazard a guess at how small COVID is by looking at that chart? Here's your COVID virus and here it shows up on your scale. How small is COVID? Okay, 50 nanometers. So we've got a range here, don't we? Somewhere between maybe 50 and 100 nanometers. COVID itself is also, um, has, has a range of sizes, but the average is about 100 nanometers for that eggshell, for that capsid. And so uh, that's, that's the size of what we're looking at. And you'll notice that it's well below what's visible either to the naked eye or via a light microscope. In fact, we can only see viruses like COVID-19 by looking at an electron microscope. And Ernst Ruska was a German scientist in 1940 who developed the electron microscope and showed the first images of the first virus seen with an electron microscope, which is the Phage virus. So we owe that credit to him that we can see what these viruses look like. I think you've all seen pictures of COVID-19 somewhere along the way. Well, a question you might ask is, how does COVID-19 make me sick? If you look at the virus closely, you'll see that it, it, it has these stickers, it has the zipper inside, and that sticker and zipper is a little bit like a game that I used to play a lot when I was a kid. You have a sort of a flat sheet here with some, some uh, uh, Velcro on it, and you have a sticky ball, and that ball tends to stick to the Velcro. And that's a little bit like what COVID-19 does when it interacts with the surfaces of cells that line the interior cavities of your body. Those stickers on the outside, those spike proteins, stick to the cell surface receptors, the ACE2 receptors. And by sticking to that cell surface, something interesting happens there's an effect that we can just refer to as ringing the bell. The virus rings the bell of that cell. The cell opens the door, and inside the cell are a lot of treats that the virus is going to use to play a trick on the cell. And the trick that the virus plays is that it multiplies. So if you look at this picture, you can see quite a few cells up here in these cell layers of the tissue. You can see quite a few cavities called vacuoles in the cells, and inside those cavities you can see viruses, as well as virus particles on the exterior of that particular tissue. So one question you might be interested in is, if one virus infects a cell, how many viruses are there in a typical cell? Anyone like to hazard a guess? Well, let's take a poll. How many say there's at least more than one virus? Okay, we, we've established that fact. How many say about 10 viruses in a cell? How many say more than 10 viruses? There certainly can be. It turns out if you take all the COVID-19 in a person, 
divide that by the number of cells in the person, the average number of viruses that you get inside your cell is about 10. About 10 viruses on average per cell. So how does COVID know to multiply inside the cell? The very first thing that happens is the virus that's inside that capsid unwraps. That capsid collapses, if you will, and when that happens, the zipper inside is exposed to the inside of the cell. And that zipper ends up being the virus instruction set. And the instruction set is pretty simple. It has two basic components. The first part of that instruction set says, hijack the cell. Take advantage of all those treats inside the cell to do part number two of what's on the instruction set, which is make more virus. That virus instruction set corresponds to a unique virus fingerprint because every strain of virus that's different has a different fingerprint. In fact, different strains of the same virus, like the alpha variant versus the delta variant, also have a different fingerprint. Scientists call this virus fingerprint ribonucleic acid in the case of COVID-19. And the first scientist to identify nucleic acid was Friedrich Meischer. He was a Swiss scientist that identified the nuclear material in the nucleus of the cell and called it nucleic acid. Well, how does COVID-19 write its fingerprint to make more virus? It uses the virus code. You can think of the virus code as four different colors, Aggie blue, crimson, tan, and green. And the virus writes those in a linear series along the length of its zipper. So you can see Aggie blue, and green, and crimson, and tan written in a linear series, just like you have a linear zipper. It writes them in a sort of interesting way. If you count the teeth in the zipper, if you count three teeth for every green and three teeth for every red, two teeth for every blue and two teeth for every tan, that's how the virus counts the number of interactions that those colors can have when it's on the instruction set. So the virus code is formed by colors. Scientists call these colors nucleotide bases. And the first scientist to really characterize these nucleotide bases was Phoebus Levine, happened to be at Columbia University, where Greg and I have both spent some time. Greg is postdoc at Columbia University. First question I have on this picture is, is the whole zipper accounted for in the picture? Do you see the entire zipper here in the picture? How many folks say they see the entire zipper? We'll do it by a poll. How many folks say there's a part of the zipper missing? You're right. In this picture, we only have one half of the zipper. And we're going to refer that to one strand of the zipper, just part of that. The ribonucleic inside COVID-19 is just a single strand. It's not paired yet. Scientists also have, whoops, back up. Oops, now yeah, I'm going the wrong way. Oops, I gotta press the bottom button to go back. Scientists also have a name for each of the nucleotide bases. The Aggie blue color corresponds to adenine, crimson corresponds to cytosine, tan to uracil, and G to guanine. Virus uses a secret in the instruction set to make another virus, and that secret is matching. Aggie blue only matches with tan, and crimson only matches with green, and those matching colors allow the virus to take that single strand of the zipper and make another strand that corresponds to the first strand, that instruction set, or what scientists call a template. Scientists say that these bases or colors pair 
in order to replicate RNA or to make more virus. And Walter Sutton was an American scientist, the first scientist to identify the pairing between nucleic acid elements. And Erwin Chargaff in the 1940s was the first scientist to actually associate A with U and G with C. And so now the question, is the whole zipper figured in this picture? And the answer is yes. There are two strands of fingerprint in each pair of that ribonucleic acid that's made by matching. Well, you might ask, what does the matching? This is one of those treats inside the cell that the virus hijacks. We're going to call it Pac-Man. Pac-Man does the matching. And he does it in an interesting way. He matches that crimson with green, and he matches the Aggie blue with tan, and he does it in a way that he always leaves behind those matching pairs connected to each other by these teeth that we talked about. Two teeth for green and crimson, excuse me, three teeth for green and crimson, two teeth for Aggie blue and tan. So the question is, if you look at this series, there's green matched with crimson, Aggie blue matched with tan. I have green over here. Which color is Pac-Man going to put in that square? Anybody want to hazard a guess? It's going to be crimson again. You've got a green right here. Pac-Man's going to match that with crimson. And same thing over here. You've got a crimson. Your slider on your zipper is a little bit like Pac-Man, putting both strands of the zipper together. He's going to put a green over here as well. The first scientists to characterize Pac-Man were three scientists, actually, simultaneously in different laboratories. One was Herard Hurwitz, the second was Audrey Stevens, and the third was Samuel Weiss in about 1960. Pac-Man has a relatively long name. It's RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So when Pac-Man finishes, there's another copy of the virus fingerprint. So here's Pac-Man pretty close to the start of making another strand. And here's Pac-Man at the finish line. And you can see that he's made a copy of that fingerprint strand. There's something kind of unusual about that copy, though. It's not really a duplicate copy. What kind of a copy would you call it? Hard to hear with the masks, I know. It's a complementary strand. The copy is formed with the complementary colors from our virus code. Instead of a green, it has a red. Instead of a tan, it has an aggie blue, and so on and so forth. So it got copied, but it's really a complementary copy. It's not a duplicate copy. And the first scientist to identify that complementary strand was Erwin Chargoff in the 1940s. We call the fingerprint strand the template strand whereas that first copy is called the complement or the complementary strand. Well, how does Pac-Man then go about making a duplicate copy? And you may have guessed that. If you start out with a fingerprint strand and Pac-Man makes a copy of that, if somehow those strands are separated, so here's your original fingerprint template and here's your complement copy, and Pac-Man latches on and makes a copy of each one of these, the copy that Pac-Man make of the, of the fingerprint template will be another complementary copy. The copy that Pac-Man will make of the complement will be the original template. And so in the first cycle of duplication, you end up with two pairs of the original pair. And each one of those pairs contains a fingerprint strand a, as well as a copy, your complement copy. And that's how Pac-Man makes a duplicate copy to wrap inside of a virus when it duplicates. So you can continue this type of duplication as many times as you want. And virus does that at least about 10 times per cell. So in your second cycle, instead of having two pairs of your instruction set, you would end up with four pairs of your instruction set in your set and second cycle. In your third cycle, instead of four pairs of your instruction set, you're going to get two pairs for each pair you had in cycle number two. You're going to end up with eight pairs. How many pairs would you end up with in your fourth cycle? 
how many people say you'd end up with 10? 12, 14, 16. Looks like the majority say 16, and that's right. You have a two to the nth progression here. And so we can estimate how many pairs will happen in each cycle, starting with that original pair, by just taking the number of initial pairs and multiplying that by two taken to the power of the number of cycles. So in your zero cycle, two to the zero, that's just one. Two to the one, two. Two to the three, eight. Two to the four, 16. Well, that's interesting. If we knew how quickly COVID-19 was able to duplicate those pairs and produce the proteins that make up the shell, that would give us an estimate on how fast it multiplies. Well, we know that it gets from that single virus that infected you, incidentally, to a whole lot of viruses in just two or three days. And so you might start by asking, how many copies of COVID-19 does it take to make me sick? And let's get a little more specific. How many copies of COVID-19 do you think you find in a sick adult? And I'll give you a little hint. How many people say a thousand copies in a sick adult? How many people say a million copies in a sick adult? Anybody go for a billion copies? Anybody more than a billion copies? How many people say a hundred billion copies in a sick adult? The same as the number of stars in the entire Milky Way. And that happens in just two to three days from the first time that virus <laughs> rang the bell on a cell inside one of your cavities. Just out of curiosity, whoops, I'm trying to back up again. Just out of curiosity, if you put those 100 billion virus particles end to end, how long would that stretch out? That would stretch out the width of Cache Valley in some places, about five miles. Just something to think about if someone you know comes down with the virus. Well, where are all these viruses? Certainly you figure they're gonna be in the lungs because it's a respiratory infection after all. You have those cells that line the lungs. The virus rang the bell and infected those cells. There are other cells that line your interior cavities in your body where the viruses also hang out and that includes your intestines. The viruses end up ringing the bell on the cells in your intestines. They happen to be the same type of cell that lines your lung. And so you end up having a lot of virus infecting the cells of your intestines. And that causes some complications that hopefully you're not personally familiar with. Well, how does the virus leave its fingerprint? From the lungs, it leaves by sneezing, coughing, breathing. There are 40,000 liquid drops in a sneeze. How many virus particles do you think are in that 40,000 liquid drops? How many say 40,000? How many say 100,000? There are about 200,000 virus particles that are expelled every time you sneeze. Well, where do all those virus particles go? They hang around in the air for a little while but then what happens to them? They end up on surfaces. They might end up on a windowsill. They might end up on a table. They might end up on the floor. What else is on these surfaces? Dust. How do detectives like myself lift virus fingerprint from a surface? using a vacuum. Question? It's a great question. One of the first things that scientists were interested in were trying to figure out how long the virus would remain active on a surface. The first scientist that asked that question was a, an Italian scientist by the name of Hirolamo Fracastorono, and I butchered that for all the Italians out there, I apologize. In 1546, 
he published a manuscript that called surfaces that happen to be vehicles in contagion fomites. Fomites is the Italian word, I'm told, for tinder. And so these surfaces that have virus particles or other sorts of microbes that can cause contagion, or he called them fomites for the first time. How long do those virus particles remain active on surfaces? Turns out it depends on a number of factors. Depends on the surface, depends on the temperature, depends on the humidity, depends on the exposure of other things on the surface. Generally speaking, for COVID-19, broadly speaking, those surfaces might remain contaminated with infectious virus for on the order of perhaps 24 to 48 hours. And then what happens? The, the virus just falls apart. That capsid falls apart and it leaves behind the virus fingerprint. And so when we vacuum up the virus, it's no longer infectious unless we get in there right after someone sneezed. We lift that fingerprint, but not necessarily the infectious virus. Good question. Well, how do detectives detect the virus fingerprint? Remember, those viruses are pretty small. We can't see them with the naked eye, so a magnifying glass isn't going to do us much good. Let's just start by asking the question, how small is the virus fingerprint? And before you think about answering that question, you want to think about how the fingerprint is geometrically arranged inside the capsid. I put some sticky tape on the capsid so it's not coming open very easily. If, you, if that capsid falls apart and you start to unravel the instruction set, you'll find out that instruction set is coiled very tightly inside the capsid or the shell of that virus. And if you uncoil that and uncoil that and uncoil that, this is only a fraction of how long that instruction set would be once it uncoils from the virus capsid. So you recall the virus capsid size is 80 nanometers, or 80 billionths of a meter. A meter, of course, being about a yard. How big, if you stretched it end to end, do you think the virus fingerprint would be? How many say, about 80 nanometers? Hopefully not, after my explanation. How many say, about 1,000 nanometers, about a micrometer? Any takers on a micrometer? How many say about 10 micrometers? OK, now we're getting up there. If you stretch that, caps, if you stretch that instruction set out end to end, there would be about 10 micrometers of instruction set wrapped up in that 80 nanometer capsid. Detectives detect that very small instruction set with two tricks. The first trick is that Pac-Man's cousin, we're going to call him Pac-Man sub C, has bad table manners. I'm going to say more about that in just a minute. The second trick is that heat dissolves the match. Remember the pirate code has a secret, and the secret is those colors match, Aggie blue with tan and red with green. If we heat those pairs up, we can dissolve the copy, the complementary copy from the template pair. Well, let's see how we use those tricks. The first trick is that Pac-Man cousin has bad table manners. He chews up and spits out any bits of zipper that happen to be in its way. And so if I have a strand of virus, a single-stranded template, and I have a Pac-Man that's kind of starting to do his job and matching some bases so that I get a nice match going on here, and I happen to have a little bit of complementary nucleic acid that happens to stick right out here on my RNA because it's complementary, the Pac-Man will come along and chew that up into little bits. And it'll end up looking just like that. All those bases will just kind of meander away after Pac-Man chews those up. The first scientist to describe this activity, scissors-like activity, 
of Pac-Man's cousin was Arthur Kornberg. He called this exonuclease activity, and Pac-Man's cousin is the DNA polymerase, and he was the first one to really characterize that activity in DNA polymerase. So the trick that scientists play is they take that little zipper bit, and to that little zipper bit, <clears throat> they add a molecular-sized light bulb, and they also add a molecular-sized sock. And they make sure that zipper bit is just big enough. So when they attach that light bulb to one end, and they attach that sock to the other end, the sock covers the light bulb. And then they make sure the code on that zipper bit is complementary to the code they want to find. In our case, that's the virus fingerprint. And so what happens when Pac-Man chews up that bit of zipper that's stuck to the virus code that has the light bulb covered with the sock? When Pac-Man chews that up and spits it out, the sock, which is on one end of the zipper bit, disengages from the light bulb on the other end of the zipper bit, and that light bulb lights up. We get a tiny signal. Scientists call the zipper bit a probe. The bulb is a fluorophore. That's a molecule that absorbs incident light at a high frequency and emits light at a little bit lower frequency. And the sock is called a quencher. It's a particular type of molecule that will absorb all of that emitting fluorescence until it's separated from the probe. And the first scientist to imagine this trick was Kerry Mullis at Cetus Corporation in 1991. So we use the following recipe to detect the virus fingerprint with our two tricks. We first get some dust. And it may or may not have virus fingerprint in it, so we're going to find out if it does. We're going to add our probe, we're going to add our Pac-Man and our nucleotide bases. That Pac-Man and probe is going to stick to our fingerprint. Pac-Man's going to chew up our probe and make a copy. We're going to heat that copy away from the original template to separate strands. We're going to cool that so more probe and Pac-Man sticks, and we're just going to repeat that process to get little tiny signals. And the first scientist to think of that recipe was again Kerry Mullis, and he received the Nobel Prize in 1993. So we use a machine called a thermal cycler to cycle the temperature hot and cold and hot and cold. We put our sample in little wells inside that thermal cycler, and using that amplification, we can detect how many fingerprints were originally there. So for example, if I start out with an unknown number of fingerprints, I know I can double that unknown number of fingerprints by going through one heating and cooling cycle, and I'll get a tiny signal, probably too tiny to measure. I can repeat that process and get double the signal, because each time I make a new pair, I get another signal. I can keep duplicating that process until I start to get enough signal that I can measure it. So maybe by four or five cycles, I can start to measure the number of copies that I have in solution that I've duplicated based on my recipe. And so if at, four, if at the four cycle I have 64 pairs, how many cycles did I have at the zero cycle? Well, that means at the third cycle I had 32, the second cycle I had 16, the first cycle I had 8, and so the zero cycle I had 4. You can just use the inverse of the equation that we developed earlier to say that the number of initial pairs is equal to the number of pairs at any point that I can recognize those divided by 2 to the cycle number. How many cycles of doing this does it take to make 100 billion virus particles from one fingerprint? About 39. 100 billion copies, 39 cycles, 2 to the nth. Well, where else does virus leave its fingerprint? 
from the intestines, those adventurous virus, hop on the log, ride down the flume, and splash down into your toilet. Your poop, when you're sick, ends up with a whole lot of COVID-19. There are about a billion copies per gram of poop. Now, some scientist actually measured that. I'm glad that wasn't necessarily me. How many copies of virus do you think a sick person poops out every day? Well, it's got to be a whole lot because that person has about 100 billion copies of virus when they're sick. Some scientists measured that too and said, a sick person can poop out as many as 500 billion copies every day. Wait a minute. There's only 100 billion copies of virus to begin with. But remember, those virus are constantly multiplying. That 100 billion can turn into 200 billion pretty quickly. And that occurs across a 10-day infection. So there is a lot of virus in your toilet, but it doesn't stay there. Poop in your toilet goes out drain lines, down a soil stack, into the sewer system where the wastewater is sampled. And so the question is, who received Utah State University's Kazir Professor Lifetime Achievement Award in 2021? The answer is Dr. Ryan DuPont, who is pictured right here taking samples of wastewater on Utah State campus so that we can count how many virus fingerprints are in that wastewater. Where we sample wastewater tells us where the poop came from. So here's a map of lower campus. Here's one of our sample sites. We are right here inside the Science Center. And Old Main is right here. And we wouldn't contribute to this particular sampling site, but we have other sampling sites downstream that we would contribute to from here. Scientists call this a sewer shed map. We monitored wastewater in a lot of places on Utah State University. Six residence locations in Logan, three in Price, two in Blanding, multiple locations in Logan City, and at least 17 wastewater treatment plants across the state of Utah in coordination with the Department of Health. We did a lot of wastewater monitoring. We lifted that fingerprint from wastewater using a process of disinfection, clarification, concentration, extraction, and cryopreservation. We plated the virus, we amplified it, we measured it, we analyzed it, and we gave those numbers to Utah's Department of Health. And you've probably seen their website, where on any series of consecutive days, they can tell you how many viral fingerprints per gallon of water are in wastewater all across the state of Utah. In fact, you can compare the virus fingerprint in wastewater to the number of sick people in any one of those municipalities. And if you remember where you were on June 8, 2020, that was when we had the Cache Valley spike, infamously. And that's when wastewater scientists first realized, at least here in Cache Valley, that wastewater monitoring gives you an early alert. The number of fingerprints of the virus that we found in wastewater in Cache Valley spiked in advance of the clinical cases being reported. What did the Department of Health do with that data? They monitored areas that had limited clinical testing, like Blanding. They targeted resource deployment, like mobile cl clinical testing to places where people were exhibiting symptoms and media messages. They use it to understand case data, like when did the Delta variant enter Utah or other variants. They use it to monitor transient events, like holidays or tourism, to identify other strains of the virus, like an outbreak of COVID-19's cousin, coronavirus 43. And they use it to support interventions. Utah State was the fourth university in the world to start to use wastewater monitoring to monitor COVID-19. Ultimately, hundreds of universities around the world picked up on that. And here I show data from the 1st of April, 2021. We have 248 universities across 50 countries at 1,930 sites that are monitoring wastewater. And that number was increasing rapidly. And here's some data monitored in various counties and municipalities across the United States. 
So now you know a little bit about how in COVID detectives lift viral fingerprints from air and from water. And the detectives that do this routinely in my laboratory uh, are in the dozens by this point over the past couple years. And we're assisted by Dr. Ryan DuPont and his colleagues who gather the wastewater, by John Bostock from housing and Ben Barrett from facilities who help set up and monitor that. Dr. Randy Martin's here in the audience. He spent some time helping me sample wastewater at a local municipality. We are assisted by a number of individuals at Utah State University Eastern as well as Utah State University Blanding. And so with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks for your time and attention. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Any questions? So if I, if I understand it, the question is, we've talked about tracking the fingerprint on fomites on surfaces or in wastewater. What about tracking the fingerprint inside the body? How many of you have been tested for COVID-19? What do they do when they give you a test? They take that swab and stick that way back in the back of your brain and swirl it around, right? Pull it back out. What do they do with that swab? they actually do almost exactly what we do with wastewater. They take that under aseptic conditions, they disinfect that to a degree, they handle that so it doesn't contaminate the people handling that, then they go through the same amplification procedure so that the number of fingerprint copies that happen to be in your saliva and whatever else they picked up in that swab are amplified. The only thing they don't do is they don't count necessarily the number of fingerprints. They just say, once the number of those light bulbs reaches a certain number, passes a threshold, then you have enough of that fingerprint that I can diagnose you as being sick. And other scientists monitor that over the course of an infection, as well as many months, weeks and months after an infection, and have shown that in individual cases, we don't know globally, but in individual cases, people can continue to shed viral fingerprint, harbor the virus for months, up to three to six months from some studies that I've heard. You can continue to harbor the virus. That's not unusual for viruses. How many of you have had chicken pox? How many of you have an aged relative who suffers from shingles? which is a debilitating and painful disease that's due to harboring the chickenpox virus for decades inside your system. It resurfaces when you're older and your immune system is depressed and start to cause great pain. So it's not at all unheard of that we can harbor viruses for long extended periods of time in various ways. Good question. Yes. Yeah, I got the idea by two colleagues who were sitting right here in the front row, who, um, uh, one of whom was, was working with the Utah Department of Health and two other institutions who received the instructions on how to get the virus out of the wastewater from a laboratory of a colleague in Australia. And they contacted Utah State University and said, we would like you to partner with us to look at the wastewater in northern Utah. And so that email came through. How many of you have been around for more than one pandemic? Raise your hand. There are a few of us here. Um, the previous pandemic, the HIV pandemic, I was a scientist at Merck Research Laboratories in West Point, Pennsylvania. 
and we developed this method for assaying viral fingerprint for HIV virus and nucleic acid that corresponded to HIV virus. So when the call came in to do what we were doing here in this pandemic, we didn't have it set up in the laboratory, but I knew that we could do it relatively quickly because of our capability doing it for actually the first time back in about 1996. So if you think about the history, Kerry Mullis did this for the very first time in about 1991. Received the Nobel Prize in 1993, and in 1995, 1996 timeframe in Merck, we were using this to develop a vaccine Canada against HIV. So it, it, went, it permeated that quickly into the scientific realm. Very powerful tool technology. Thanks. Any other questions? Yes. So now that it's scanned in the way Joe does, where do you see it going from here in terms of not just this pandemic, but other potential applications down the road? Well, that's a good question. There, it's a complicated question. At first, you might think, well, we can, just, we can just continue to use this for all sorts of different viruses or, or infections. And in fact, this tool is not the first time it's been used to monitor a, a viral or infectious outbreak. The polio virus is, is probably the first viral infection this tool was used to monitor. They used wastewater monitoring to track where polio infections were occurring so they could identify people who harbored the polio virus and either treat them or vaccinate those communities. The tool has also been used for monitoring infectious outbreaks in wastewater in different parts of the United States and also for monitoring outbreaks of bacterial infection. Um, it's been used surreptitiously to monitor things like the uh, 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 proliferation of nuclear waste or, or bioterror. Okay, because if someone is making a bioweapon and happens to flush some down the toilet, you can amplify that pretty quickly by this method. It's also been used to track things like uh, the use of illicit drugs. So you might anticipate that one of the issues with that becomes a concern about personal privacy and whether the information that you flush down the toilet becomes public information. And, and there are various legal perspectives on that. Generally speaking, in a large municipality, once you flush the toilet, anything that you put down the toilet, you no longer have personal rights to. Um, so that's not as much a barrier now as just the technology, the cost and expense of doing the testing. So in a situation like a pandemic where it's affordable, the Department of Health is still doing it for COVID-19. One of the first things that we might think about doing it for that's another public health risk that is virtually unchecked, is antibiotic resistant bacteria. You can monitor the proliferation of antibiotic resistant bacteria in a community and deduce what they're resistant to and potentially use that information to help physicians know which antibiotics to prescribe and which not to prescribe in that community due to the antibiotic resistance. And so there's interest in moving this technology in that direction for public health purposes. And you can see another of, a, 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 a number of other similar applications moving forward. Yes, Randy. Do you have any idea or sense for the difference in the like, viral loading between the respiratory system and the gastrointestinal system? Yeah, that's a good question. The question is, how many viruses are in the respiratory tract versus the virus in the gastrointestinal tract? I would say it varies pretty significantly because some individuals that have been monitored by scientists don't seem to excrete the virus in their fecal material, whereas others do tremendously. And, and I imagine maybe that depends on how the, the infection is localized in a particular patient. It may localize in some patients in the respiratory tract. I, it may localize in some patients in the intestinal tract that don't have respiratory symptoms because we know there are people who can carry the virus asymptomatically. I, I haven't seen any studies that answer that question directly. In order to assay that, you would need to be able to sample tissue and probably in humans, that would take 
at least a clinical trial, and I don't know whether that's been done. Yeah. Good question, though. Yes, question. Yeah, that's a good question. Difference between the rapid test, where you get your results very quickly, and the longer test, which is usually the PCR test. Again, it's a complicated question because there are now many, many different types of rapid tests, some of which rely on this amplification by polymerase chain reaction, but most of which are still antigen tests. That is, what they're testing for is not the fingerprint, they're testing for the sticky. They're testing for the, the sticker or the spike protein. And the way they do that is with an antibody, a particular protein that binds to that sticky, that spike protein, and then uses a similar fluorophore, uses a similar flor, flor, uh, 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 miniature bulb technique. It lights up if it happens to bind. And so there are similar elements to technology, but you can, you can test using an antibody and that light bulb much more quickly than you can amplify the virus. The, the reason for that is because in order to amplify the virus in a controlled way, you still have to do that in very carefully controlled clinical conditions, a place we call a CLIA laboratory. So one of the things my laboratory is working on is developing a way to do that test in any environment outside a CLIA laboratory. So we can do that in places that don't have the types of equipment like the $30,000 thermal cycler that CLIA laboratories use for the amplification. Yes? Check an area for nutrition yeah. or lack of nutrition. Say. Oh, if a, person, if a person doesn't get enough calcium yeah, or fiber, potentially? Low area, low oh, oh, like a commun... Oh, that's an interesting question. Could you use wastewater monitoring or some variant of this technology to monitor nutrition in a particular neighborhood? Yeah. I suspect that a, a clever scientist could figure out how to do that. There's a, there's a really... There are significant correlations between gut microbes and gut health, and your gut microbes are adventurous all the time. Get on the log, go down the flume, splash down into your toilet, and head down the sewer system. And so there's no problem in sampling gut microbes in a community, and nutrition could be very well one of the things that you would test for. That's an interesting idea, public health idea. Yes? So your, your body goes through an interesting arc when you get infected. A few viruses ring the bell, the cell opens the door, virus rushes in, takes all those pieces, starts to multiply. You can actually, in fact, you're more contagious. You actually expel more virus into your surroundings before you start feeling ill. That was one of the big issues with the pandemic is that it could transmit to people around you before you knew you were sick. Ergo, the masks and the social distancing and the, and the quarantine, if you were detected as having virus, to keep you from infecting other people. So about two or three days, you start feeling really ill. The number of viruses has gone from 10 or so to 100 billion. You have a huge viral load. That makes you also pretty contagious because the more viruses you expel when you sneeze, that 200,000 number, if that happens to be in the airspace when Greg walks by, he's going to breathe that in. And if his immune system is having a bad day, he's going to get the virus. But as, as your recovery progresses, as your immune system fights the virus, your immune system does a couple of things. It attacks the cells that are infected with the virus, and it destroys the cells. And then the humoral side of your immune system develops antibodies against the virus. And those antibodies prime your T cells to emit cytokines to destroy any other cell which harbors the virus. So pretty quickly, your immune system in a healthy person 
can start to eradicate this Milky Way of viruses in your system, such that the viral load decreases and decreases and decreases after a period of time to the point that you feel better, and the number of viruses that you're sneezing out or pooping out decreases substantially. And scientists, again, I, I, I haven't read all the studies, but the Centers for Disease Control has determined from a lot of scientific studies that that window in which, you, in which you're most contagious is a 10-day window from the point at which you start exhibiting symptoms until that 10 day is finished, knowing that two days before you exhi exhibit symptoms, you're highly contagious as well, but likely not going to realize you have the virus. That's, when they, that's why they do case containment, to try to get you quarantined before you come down with symptoms, because that's when you're most contagious. Does that answer your question? Yes, I have a follow-up question. Sure. So the, the number of them decreases, but your immune system retains, because you've amplified those so big, that triggers another process in your immune system to retain the memory of that antibody. So that in the, in the event that you were infected again with the same strain, your immune system wouldn't have to go through the cycle of reinventing the wheel it already has the capability to start using that antibody very quickly to suppress that infection. And that's the trick with variants. Those antibodies are primed against that sticky spike protein. So if the spike protein changes, your immune system may or may not recognize the new sticker on the new variant. We have uh, two questions from home, Keith, uh, viewers at home. So, one is, do the COVID vaccines differ in how they work? And if so, how? <laughs> yes. yes, they do. So one of the COVID vaccines is the type of vaccine that I helped to develop for against HIV when I was at Merck. It's a viral vector based vaccine. That means what scientists do is they actually take an adenovirus, or an, I think it's an adenovirus, in some cases it could be an adeno-associated virus, and they take the nucleic acid, that instruction set for COVID-19, and they roll that up really tightly, we call that supercoiling, and they stick that, they don't stick that, they basically grow cells that amplify that nucleic acid, just like I've showed you here, and those cells encapsulate that inside the virus coat. And then they take that virus, and they basically inject you with that virus. And that virus infects your cells, the capsid comes apart, the shell comes apart, and that nucleic acid starts to amplify. And the moment that it does, your immune system starts to recognize that and develops an immune response. Other vaccines are just the RNA itself. They're a different type of RNA called messenger RNA. And it's constructed very cleverly so that when you're injected with that messenger RNA, it can very rapidly stimulate your immune system and produce those humoral antibodies against the virus and produce the response and prime your immune system so when it sees the virus, it can react very quickly. Different types of vaccines use different ways to prime your immune system and different viral loads. All of those differences react with your immune system differently and give you a different result. And so your, your vaccines vary pretty significantly in terms of their efficacy and probably in terms of their uh, responsiveness to, to, to a viral infection. Keith, and the, the other one I think you've, you've touched on, but the question is, can you monitor bacterial illnesses from wastewater? <laughs> yes, the answer to that is that you could, and I'm going to think about the answer to that carefully because there are going to be some nuances there. One of the interesting things about the virus is the number 
of copies of virus that are present when you're ill. A hundred billion is a big number, as many as stars in the Milky Way. When you have a bacterial infection, the number of cells that you have in a bacterial infection is typically nowhere near the number of cells, and I'm generalizing broadly, there's probably exceptions in, in all the sorts of different cases, but generally speaking, nowhere near the number of copies of infectious cells that you have in a, in, a, in a cellular infection. And so the number of copies of fingerprint of you would have an infection in something like the, the wastewater system is gonna be a lot smaller. So you'd need a more sensitive way to pull that out and detect that, which is something that we've developed in our laboratory that could be useful for that. Another nuance is that the virus is a really simple entity. It's a shell with sticky on the outside and gooey on the inside. That's pretty much it. When the virus falls apart, nothing much else happens. When a cell falls apart, it has an instruction set that says, chew up everything here. And that instruction set that says, chew up everything there might also degrade the signal. Whereas a virus just leaves its fingerprint wherever it goes. So there's a couple of differences, but generally speaking, the answer is potentially yes with some caveats. Thank you. You know, I think we are running past the top of the hour, and I think uh, I want to call it a night. I want to thank Dr. Roper for an excellent talk. So thank you, Keith. <laughs>